So first one, hello Shannon and Dr. Doreen. My child with ASD will be four next month. He is limited verbal, uses some sign language. Every day I deal with lots, all in capitals, of tantrums, screaming, hitting, mm. uh, hitting everybody by punching a lot, kicking, throwing anything, trying to break things in the house. I used to give him a timeout in a special place, but he started getting up to go after anybody to hit and punch. So I started putting him in the crib until he calms down, but he destroys the bed, removes all the blankets, and takes off his clothes and diaper while he's screaming upset. The minute he calms down, I get him out, and he has to pick up the mess he did, but I can't do the same when we're out, and he decides to kick, hit, and scream. I'm out of ideas and very stressed dealing with two with ASD. Uh, he is on a full-day program with therapies. He needs a lot of redirection and have lots of problems with transition. I'm using PEX, too, but he gets aggressive when things change and when he can get and when he can get his way. I think it's when he can't get his way, but it says can get his way, so I might be wrong. She says, please help. I'm going out of my mind, and right. thanks. Like, I can't even imagine. It sounds like such a difficult situation. So I think it would be very important. Uh, I, I mean, I'll address this situation and give you some guidance, but I think that it would you would benefit also from going on our IBT site, Institute for Behavioral Training, um, which is ibehavioraltraining.com and um, look for uh, a module on tr that teaches you about uh, what ABA is and how you address behaviors because uh, you know the old the very old kind of thinking about behaviors like tantrums and so on was well it's a bad behavior we need to punish it in some way and uh, the child will learn not to do that behavior but ABA changed quite a bit over the last decade three decades or so and the the concept with behavior is no longer let's just take a behavior and punish it it's not at all that and it's much more now you really have to understand the function of the behavior because the function leads to a different type of intervention or different type of treatment so now let's take that concept and apply it here so several things about your child your child is um, uh, tantruming, aggressing, doing all sorts of behaviors and <clears throat> the real question is why? Why does your child do that? And you have to try to find out the reason why your child does that and the, the way we do that as behavior analysts is we do what's called a functional assessment or analysis and the functional assessment tells you exactly the function or the reason for the behavior and the way you find that out is essentially you look and see in, under what circumstances do these behaviors occur. So I'll give you the basic examples. Uh, he becomes aggressive and tantrums when something is taken away. Okay, so that's a, what's called a tangible function. That means he's trying to gain access to a tangible object or to some activity or something. He's trying to gain access to something he can't get and that's why he's hitting or aggressing okay um, if that is the case then there's a particular type of intervention for that it could also be he's trying to escape a situation so for instance he you tell him you know it's time to go to bed and he'll throw a fit or um, we can't we have to go in the car and he'll have a tantrum or whatever it is so he's trying to escape or avoid that particular situation now th those two will have completely different interventions yeah. um, you can't just go ahead and timeout is truly not effective if for instance another function could be that he's trying to get attention yeah. he's just doing this because that's his way of getting attention and if you put him in timeout uh, let's say you're putting him in timeout when he wants attention. Well, the whole process of trying to get him and put him in timeout and so on is negative attention. So he's actually gaining what he wants partially from it. Mm -hmm. um, or let's say he doesn't want to do an activity, like he doesn't want to go in the car and he throws a tantrum and you pick him up and you put him in the crib and now he's in timeout. Well, he has now gained exactly yeah. what he wanted, which is he didn't want to go in the car. So he's avoided that whole pro situation. Yes, he's going to um, you know, be upset in the crib because nobody really wants to be put in an enclosed area. And so he 
he's going to be continue his tantrum. But you're the it, this is not the right way to deal with it, which is why it's probably ineffective. So, I mean, I, I'll give you some guidelines, but honestly, with with a situation where you have two kids with ASD and you're dealing with severe behaviors, um, you really need a behavior analyst to be able to help you and teach you what the reason is for these behaviors and how to deal with each one. And very simply, if, if the child tantrums when they're trying to gain access to something, what you do is you block access so you make sure the child does not receive the thing they want based on the behavior. So if I, let's say I want to gain access to a toy, okay, and I throw a tantrum, you, what you want to make sure happens is that I still don't get that toy. By yeah. throwing a tantrum, my tantrum is not an effective way of communicating. So I tantrum, great, you can tantrum, but you're not getting that toy. In right. fact, I'm going to put that toy away so that you know your tantrum didn't work. Or let's say you want to gain, you want to avoid going in the car or avoid something like some environment that I'm asking you to, to go into now what I will do is make sure that you actually go to the environment so instead of putting you in timeout I would take you to the car and make sure you you realize the the mess the key thing is for the child to realize that their behavior their inappropriate behavior did not work it wasn't something that communicated to you because you see this is something I've said several times on this show aggressive behaviors, challenging behaviors, tantrums, hitting, throwing, whatever it is, is just a form of communication and the child can't vocalize and say, no, I want, because if the child was vocalizing, they'd be like, no, I don't want to go or no, give me that toy or whatever it is. Yeah. But our kids are not vocalizing that. Instead, they're hitting and it becomes effective because in many cases, if you hit another child, you get their toy. Yeah. If you throw a fit, mom and dad will give in because what else are they going to do? Yeah. So the, very, the key thing is that you kind of need to be doing the opposite of what you're doing in the sense that you need to find out exactly what is your child trying to gain by having this behavior and you do the opposite. It's yeah. just that simple. You don't allow them access to the object they wanted. You do put them in the environment they were trying to avoid. If they are trying to get attention, you completely ignore it. Those types of things, that's what a good ABA teaches you is that, oh, this is what he's trying to achieve. Yeah. And instead, um, you teach the child some basic communication so that the, the whole concept is Having a challenging behavior or maladaptive behavior is ineffective, but here's a way that you can communicate. You can use a PEC system, you can vocalize, you can point to objects you want, you can go bring the objects, whatever it is. And this is the way that you can communicate, and not by key. having behaviors. That's Absolutely. key. Not, not letting them have the thing that they wanted with the challenging behavior, but giving them a way that they can have it in a different way, separate Absolutely. from that moment. Absolutely. Because if you don't teach them a, a more appropriate way or more adaptive way, then the child will revert to behavior. That's yeah. just a natural thing. Everyone will. Yeah. You know, this has nothing to do with autism. By the way, behaviors have nothing to do with autism. This is like a very interesting thing that people don't realize. People think that children with autism are generally just, you know, tantruming and badly behaved or whatever it is. No, it has nothing to do with it. It's not even a symptom of autism. It's just a side effect of not being able to communicate. Yeah. That's it. It's just a result of not being able to communicate. Now, so the, another important thing is you mentioned here that your child has some language or mm -hmm. some speech. I really, really strongly recommend, and he's four, I strongly recommend that you get a intensive, high quality ABA program for your child because if he has some language, he has the potential to learn language and speech. I don't know how much language or speech he has, so I can't comment, but when a child has some vocal ability and is only four, I would really be pushing the language. And even if the language does not come in, 
then I would really give him a very significant other form of communication. Make a decision. It could be sign, it could be PEX, picture exchange communication system, it could be reading, it could be a multitude, it could be an augmentative device, whatever it is. Pick one and stick with it. Okay. Don't do a whole bunch of different things like, oh, half the thing, you know, the five things you can communicate with me vocally. You know, five things, you're on a PEC system and then you know three signs. That's extremely, you're teaching your child three languages. Okay. That's not okay, pick one. Um, my preference always with vocal kids is to use visual programs like a PEC system mm -hmm. and the vocalization because I'm not really ready to give up on the vocalization. Right. Um, I, sign is okay and some kids are pretty good with sign, it's just very limiting uh, because you know, you're, you're the person that you're communicating with has to know sign as well. Right. So those are the, the basic feedback I can give you. Um, you know, I really do recommend that you get professional help because uh, your child sounds like he might have much more potential than you're actually tapping into because you're dealing with so much behavior that you're kind of locked into that right now. And it's understandable because, you know, like as you always say, you when the whole house is on fire or something. Yeah, when your kitchen's on fire. fire you gotta you got to deal with the fire. Yeah, you do. But, you know, the, the positive side, I guess, is that behavioral issues are minuscule for good behaviors to deal with. They're tiny. This is not a big deal. All of these behaviors can come under control. Uh, you, the, the other big part of a, a effective behavioral program is that it needs to be kind of around the clock. And when you have, when it's just you and you're dealing with the other child and you have to take your, both of your children out to the community, you just don't have the resources or the ability to be able to be consistent with behavioral techniques all the time. This is why we have 30, 40 hours of intervention, a staff of four or five therapists on each child because what what they do is they make the environment completely consistent so the child learns I'm never going to have uh, get away with something I'm never going to be able to tantrum and get a toy I'm never going to be able to tantrum to avoid something I might as well give up and I will learn now a better form of communication and it happens much more rapidly yeah, yeah and I, I love what you're saying you, you need help you and that doesn't make help. you weak um, that makes you in a position to potentially be really strong but you you need to have some help. I don't know anybody who could do this by themselves. I couldn't do this by I, myself. I and I've done I this. And let me tell you, I've treated thousands of kids for 30, over 30 years. I could not do the behavioral program for two children uh, by myself. There's no way I could do it. It's just, it's not something that you're capable of doing. So please get help. And it sounds like, I mean, you said you have some therapies. I don't know if you just have speech, perhaps OT or something. You need an intensive ABA program. Your child is still in the early intensive behavioral intervention age. Four is still considered a very young age where you should be doing a completely intensive, which means 25 to 40 hours and I would push for the 40 hours in your in your case and I'm not sure that it's just the other child that's getting therapy in terms of how the question is worded so okay. both children need to be getting therapies right. and all these things that right. you're talking about and since you do have some therapy you can be asking them to find the function of the behavior because that's the beginning right. of, of being effective and you we, have to know the function and we don't know where this family is we don't know uh, what part of the world you're in but if you're if you're still watching with us this question came in this morning, let us know what part of the world you're in, um, because it may be that uh, it may be that we're in that location, yes. or we're near that location, or we can set up remote services for you. And it may be that you're in a state that has insurance coverage, so that you can get the 40 hours of therapy at no cost to you. Yeah. Uh, and if you're out, we've got new news about the direction guidelines for Medicaid uh, around the country. So more and more people, it looks like, are eligible. Uh, uh, for services. Which so don't give up. All right. Uh, I'm going to move on to the next question here. Uh, hi, Shannon and Dr. Doreen. I'm trying to decide whether to keep my son in a specialized preschool or change
change to a top typical preschool. We just completed the VB map and he is on level two because of his social skills. This area was the lowest. My ABA is also doing the skills, uh, but since she has mainly used the VB map, she was able to get this done a lot faster. My question is, can skills give me info on if a typical preschool might be a good fit for my son? Does the parents say the age? Uh, we don't have an age. But yeah. it's preschool, so I would so imagine very, you've uh, got to be un under the age of five. So I can't give you like a, that level of guidance just because I don't know your child's capabilities, but I will try to explain my uh, decision-making process when it comes to integrating our kids into school. Um, my process is personally, so let's say uh, preschool is what, let's say three year, three or four years of age. I don't know if it's first year preschool or second year preschool. So typically with, in my process, what I try to do is I try to get my kids as young as possible so that I have uh, the, I have a full day to, to work with them. And that means I try to get the child at two. If I get a child at three, I'm not going to put them in preschool right away. I'm just not. I'm going to be uh, focusing that year on just one-to-one -one intervention. And uh, the reason for that is that I want to give the child enough of the preliminary early skills that when I integrate my child into preschool, the child's successful. So, uh, and in my mind, there are certain key skills that need to be there. So for instance, and we won't go broad and just say language and social, but it's mostly in the areas of language, social, and executive functioning. So in terms of executive functioning, there are certain things like awareness, just being aware of your environment, being aware of your peers, um, having the ability to model from others, uh, and having the ability to sort of, uh, I guess, uh, change your behavior based on what you see in the environment. It's called observational learning. Uh, those types of things are very important to normal development. The second thing is I want the child to have a certain level of basic speech so that they can understand when a teacher says, everybody line up, you know, go get your boxes, your lunch boxes, or this is how, what I want you to work on, or go to this station or the other, or so on. Um, as well as, of course, some uh, ability to understand what peers are saying. Mm -hmm. And then I want my child to have, in terms of social, I want my child to actually know a few ways to interact. Uh, you know, so one is, obviously, it's like a, child, a small child will say something like, hey, guys, let's go on the monkey bars or whatever. Mm -hmm. Let's, who wants to do this? Or, you know, something like that. And I want the child, my child to have an understanding of that language but then also to be able to understand some social things such as you know this is how I join two other kids who are playing these are the things that, that are appropriate or this is how I can go ask another child to come play um, you know when if the teacher is yelling right now this is not a good time to go ask or something mm -hmm. I mean some very basic social and executive functioning features um, VB map is not going to address any of these things. It simply doesn't have that level of complexity in it or doesn't go to that level in terms of skills. You will find some of those things in skills. You will see uh, some of the very early uh, areas to teach in executive functioning and in language and social or maybe even also play. Uh, domains. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at those areas, you'll see, I mean, if you answer the index, the assessment, you'll see all the areas your child is below on, mm -hmm. and then that'll take you to the lessons, and then you should actually just sit there and look at the lessons yeah. and say, okay, yeah, he can't do this, and this is a pretty basic age one or age two lesson. I mean, skills takes you, tells you the age of the lesson, and I think this would be very beneficial. So your focus is just preparing your child so that when they're in school, they're not lost, um, they're not bullied, they are successful, they find it an enjoyable and reinforcing environment. Because if you mess that up, turning that around is going to be difficult. Yeah. And this is the next 12 years of your child's life. Yeah. They're going to be in school. So it needs to start out on a positive um, uh, footing. And uh, by the way, once my child has those key skills, the way that I integrate is always with a one-to-one -one shadow. I will never just put my child in preschool and say, good luck, you know? 
I will always have, and I'll start with fewer hours. So I'll typically start with three days a week, maybe three hours each day. Mm -hmm. So it's like nine hours a week um, that I'm integrating my child into school with a one-to-one -one therapist who is called the shadow. And the therapist knows how to do their job and they're there to help the child understand, to help the child initiate interactions, to help the child follow the directions that are they're supposed to. Um, they're there to get other kids to play together with the child. They facilitate everything that goes on, um, sort of like a support for the child, a shadow. And um, then I gradually increase the duration of time in school, maybe five days, and then I will, over the course of the next two to three years, fade off my shadow. So I will always have someone with the child um, so that the child is definitely successful. The, the whole process of the shadow changes, as you know, Shannon, yeah. and it becomes over time, you know, someone who's helping the teacher quite a bit and is not just there for my child. And then over time, it even becomes an unknown shadow. So we'll put a therapist in school where the child doesn't know this therapist is there for them, but is there to help them. And um, so it's a very important thing that you do school integration correctly. Um, you know, there's a lot that goes on even at the preschool level. And I know a lot of parents want their kids in preschool or in kindergarten because they want the social interaction. But you know your child better than I do, obviously. I don't know your child at all. Will your child integrate and interact successfully just by being around other kids? It's very rare that that happens. So first give your child all the tools they need and then make sure they have assistance when you put them in that situation and then all should go well. And then in terms of whether you choose to be in a specialized Special or, or, right. or regular ed. And thanks for bringing that up. So that really has to do with your child's capabilities. There are certain benefits to each environment, obviously. Yeah. The regular education type of environment, you have to be able to keep up and you have to not necessarily need a, a large amount of attention, right? Because we're talking anywhere, depending on what state you are and what location, uh, we're talking anywhere between, you know, 10 to 21 or 22 kids in the class. And so it would be very important to uh, recognize that if your child really does need one-to-one -one attention, you, the ideal situation for me is you put them in a regular ed preschool with a shadow because there they have models of very appropriate behavior from regular ed kids and they have their own one-to-one -one attention. Now many states, many schools don't allow that and so then your, your only choice is regular ed or special ed and then you have to really think about how much support does my child need. If your child needs a lot of support and a lot of help then you're looking at special ed and if you look at special ed, then the next issue becomes how much bad behavior is around my child that they can model from. Yeah. So you really always want to shoot for, uh, you know, if you're putting your child in special ed, you want to make sure the other kids don't have a lot of behavioral issues that your child could learn from. You want to make sure you have a very strong teacher who can handle, I mean, I've seen special ed classrooms, I have to say, where there's a lot of severe kids in the classroom and the teacher is spectacular yeah. and has complete control over the classroom, has a token system running, is the classroom is fantastic. Mm -hmm. So really that has to do with the particular situation. Even my own kids here at CARD, when I see children and the parents ask me this question, I'll never answer that unless I have a supervisor who can go out and do an observation of all the environments that are, that are options. Yeah. And it really has to do with the best fit for your child. All great advice, because I think it's as much to do as your child as the, the setting. The setting, because, absolutely. You know, I mean, you it some, varies so different. Totally. Just like regular education yeah. classrooms, some are fantastic and some are awful. And it is hard when you're a parent, you go and you view it, and you're seeing it at a time when they've set up for you to see it. It's very hard to know. But I will say this, is that, you know, you, you make a choice based on what your team says, what you see, and you can always change it. I always forget that as a parent, that if it's not working out, I can always change it later on. Very true. And the other unfortunate thing is that most people in this country don't have a team. Yeah. It's all on you, you know, and it's very yeah. hard. So I, 
I hope that you have a team and when we refer to team it means your ABA supervisor and your therapist and perhaps you have a speech pathologist or occupational therapist or so on. You should have a team because it really does take a village to raise kids. It certainly to does. <laughs> I used to say it took a small city. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but anyway, we're going to take a short break and then we're going to come back with more of your questions. Keep them coming in. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Ask Dr. Doreen. Dr. Doreen Grampuche is here answering your questions in real time. So thrilled to have you back Thank with you us. So much. And uh, I'm going to jump right into another question. Hi, ladies. My son is 50 months old. He twirls his hair to the point. I'm sorry, 50? 50, 5 zero, Okay. So which is, the math is always hard for me on that. Four years, two months. Okay. okay. Uh, twirls his hair to the point that he has knots in it and now has some bald spots. We are just starting ABA and she seems to think it could be a stimming behavior. The school thinks it could be him using it as avoidance. He has communication and is potty trained. He is talking more each day, but mainly behind in social skills and communicating. Can you give me your thoughts on what this might be and what we can do to help him? Um, I, you know, I'm going to throw something out. I don't know your child. I can't give you uh, this is, it's not something that every child does, but when, and in ABA, you know, when we refer to self stimulatory or stereotypical behavior, that basically means nothing. It means it's a repetitive stereotypical behavior that, ha that is where the function is not really, uh, an external function. It's an internal function. So in other words, we don't know why the child does it. That's sort it, of the... It may feel good. It, it may, may replace something. Right. It, you know. Exactly. So now from my own experience, I would say... Uh, so first of all, in, in typically developing adults, people do that, right? Mm -hmm. They do this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And it's a very... Um, I guess it's a a mild version of indicating um, something like anxiety. So it's kind of like, uh, I don't know, people chew on their pens, mm -hmm. they chew their nails, they twirl their hair, mm -hmm. all this sort of stuff. And I would say um, it's a habit more than anything else. And it's a habit that has perhaps developed for a sensory process that was calming. Mm -hmm. um, it could have been, um, I, you know, there's there are some psychological disorders called trichotillomania which basically you pull out hair actually and and that a lot of people do that and um it's just it's a it's a anxiety reducing behavior that becomes a habit so i'm not sure if that is the case but um that's something to consider the way that i would treat that is very very simple i would actually give the child um, some object that replaces that behavior. And unfortunately, we have a ton of objects that you can use. There's, uh, if you go into online and you look for sensory um, toys, um, there's these uh, little, uh, what, I don't even know what they're made of. They have, it's rubber on the outside, inside is some sort of a very soft metal. Mm -hmm. And actually they are for, you can bend them. I think they're called bendies or I don't oh, know. Oh what. yeah, benderoos. Yeah, so benderoos or there something. You can bend them, you can twirl them, you can do all sorts of fun stuff like that. And um, in fact, they have the propensity to bend, to go around, like they're like a coil. Right. And they will go around your finger much like your hair would. Mm -hmm. And so that might be, that might be something that can give your child the same uh, sensation as twirling hair. And if it is an anxiety type thing, then anything you give your child in their hand will actually reduce the anxiety. Because it so competes is, with it, right? You can't it, twirl your hair and play with something well, in your hand. Absolutely. And also, just as a treatment for anxiety, having an object to play with mm -hmm. is something that reduces anxiety. I don't, it, like in the, in the old days, in the Middle East, and I think even the Far East and so on, men would always hold... Uh, what is sort of the equivalent of rosary beads, uh -huh. you know, and they would play with it all day. In fact, right now, even if you go to the Middle East, um, they do. A yeah. lot of men have like a necklace type thing and they'll uh -huh. just hold it in their hand all day long and they will move the beads over. Yeah. And that's completely normal in that part of the world. Yeah. If you do that here, people would be looking and saying, what is that? <laughs> so... But my point is that, yes, you're giving your child something that would keep their hands busy. Mm -hmm. It would have a very similar sensation and it would be perfectly fine because once the child gets off the hair onto this object, you can actually teach the child to put the object in their 
uh, pocket and use it only at certain time frames. Okay. So in other words, you're re redirecting the behavior to another stimulus and then you're shaping the schedule so that the, the stimulus is only used when it's appropriate, the, the other object that you pick. Um, you, you might have to rotate objects a little bit until you find something that does interest your child. But now when you do start the intervention, you will now block the hair. You won't allow the child to do the twirling of the hair. Every time they do that, you'll replace it with this object. Uh, in fact, you might even want to replace it with the object all, at all times. Um, so that's basic. It's a, it should be a reasonably easy thing to do in terms of changing the, the stimulus. Um, and I wouldn't be too worried about it because kids develop a lot of um, obsessive compulsive behaviors, a lot. All kids, not just kids on the spectrum, they go through um, a phase of life where at different ages, typically somewhere between, I don't know, three, four, maybe two, eight, nine even, or even later, maybe even 15, where they are kind of different things in the universe uh, uh, grow in their minds and in their imagination and they fear it and in order to calm themselves they, they develop patterns of behavior and they, these could be things like checking you know the closet and the door and this and making sure they're safe or it could be uh, looking at an object ten times. As strange as these things sound all kids do these things um, or it could be you know, playing with hair or chewing their nails or whatever it is. And I wouldn't worry about it too much, okay. but you can replace it because it sounds like it's very concerning. I'm a little concerned about that the school thinks it might be avoidance because then my head goes to what is he avoiding? And I, if we're talking about a four-year-old, they're probably doing some crayon and some, you know, pencil and those kinds of things. Right. If, um, aren't there some sensory things that she can get? Like there's those pencil toppers Absolutely. that make a pencil more right? exciting. Um, there's the, the likelihood that a twirling of hair behavior is an avoidance type behavior in my mind is low. Okay. I don't think Great. it could be an avoidance behavior. I, I, you'll know right away if it only happens when a demand is placed. Okay. Does it only happen when they ask him to do something with paper and pencil? Okay. Then it could be avoidance. And if it is, then you realize that the demands that the demand that is being placed on him is anxiety provoking or somehow very difficult and which is why he's avoiding it and they can easily uh, intervene and just basically model for him and make it a very short period of time and then increase the time okay. frame that he works but I mean that's the only that's the only way that it would be avoidance if he okay. doesn't do it under any other circumstance great to know okay wonderful uh, gonna move on to another question what's the difference between OCD and routine slash and flexibilities kind of goes hand in hand with this right when would it be appropriate to get a child assessed for OCD so uh, OCD is obsessive compulsive disorder um, anything that is considered a disorder or is called a disorder has to be to the point that it interrupts or disrupts normal functioning so um, you could have someone who's very, very organized. In fact, I always say a certain level of OCD is healthy, right? A certain level of anxiety is healthy. If we did, had zero anxiety and zero obsession about, you know, uh, things being the right way, we'd be lazy, stay at home and never do anything or take care of ourselves. So uh, it, something becomes an actual disorder only when it's disruptive to your normal life. And the way that's defined in normal life with a child would be they're functioning amongst peers at school um, and within the family. With adults, it's uh, kind of w at work and within your family. So, you know, the example I often give is it's not because if you, you can drink, you know, uh, 10 bottles of scotch a day, as long as you go to work and you treat your family well, that's not considered uh, alcoholism or any kind of alcoholic uh, um, disorder, anything, or even even uh, dependence. Um, but with, with OCD, generally OCD develops to the point that it is quite disruptive. So people are, for instance, uh, having to do the compulsive behavior so much uh, that they can't do other things. So in other words, uh, you know, oh, the obsessive compulsive is this. You have an obsession, which is in your head, and you do a compulsion, which is the behavior that you do, in order to calm the obsession. That's how OCD functions. So 
uh, I think I might have left the stove on, um, I have to go back home and check it. And that becomes to the point where it's not once, but it's 10 times and it prevents me from even leaving the house. Or I think I have germs on my hands and I have to wash them and they're not getting clean. So the compulsion becomes overwhelming and takes over your life. Now with our kids, the way they exhibit OCD is stuff like, as I mentioned, sometimes our kids are experiencing anxiety. OCD is a reaction to anxiety, just also something else people should know. So sometimes they're experiencing some anxiety and they'll do things like, I don't know, um, you know, they'll check or they'll want to make sure. This is a common thing that our kids do, which is some of our kids that are perfectionists about something. Mm -hmm. They won't write or do their homework because it's just not perfect enough. I have to redo it. I have to redo it. And so if you keep redoing something, you're going to fall behind from the rest of the class. You yeah. can't let it go. And that is, I mean, this behavior increases as soon as stress level and anxiety increases. It is so tied into have uh, stress it's you know being the need to do things perfectly that's just an example of it so unless your child's at a point where their compulsive behavior their ritualistic behavior is uh, really holding them back then uh, from everything then they don't have enough of the symptoms to call it OCD nevertheless you could have let's say one or two symptoms that are beginning to approach a level of severity that are concerning and that would be inflexibility uh, you know insisting on routines that make things inflexible and I'll give you an example um, so you know uh, my daughter wants to go on a trip or something and certain things have to be a certain way in her backpack or in her suitcase well you know what that's fine because she can do that because it gives her a sense of I'm organized, I know where everything is, I can pull it out when I need it, all this sort of stuff. Now, if she spends a ton of time worrying about how perfect is this? What if I can't access it when I need it? Um, and this causes her undue stress and, and emotion and anxiety. Now it's becoming a problem. Now she really needs to work on just chilling out and calming down about it. So that's kind of the answer, like, you know, the inflexibility and those types of things that we observe in our kids. We try to treat it at that level because we don't want it to become a pattern that is so disruptive to their universe. Great. Uh, wonderful. I'm going to move on because we have so many questions I want to sure. get to. How do I motivate my adult daughter to keep her room clean? It's a mess. She has plenty of time to clean it, but would rather sit in a chair and drink coffee. Any ideas for me? I've tried a token <laughs> board, but it doesn't last. Thanks for your advice. I think this hits so many questions. How do we get somebody to care about something they don't care about? <laughs> that me, we care about, I, right? Yeah, I should go home and implement my own advice now <laughs> on my 13-year-old. On my there we go. You know, so I, it's, a, it's a matter of um, what was it that I did with my 13 year old right before we were leaving? I'm trying to remember because she cleaned her room up like spectacularly. Yeah. I think it was just pure cash. Okay. I think it was like, you want to go shopping, I will give you like $50 if you clean your room completely. And it happened in 24 hours. So, and it was like two in the morning and she was cleaning her room, you know? So I think it's just a matter of exactly what you said, Shannon. It's, it's, uh, making sure that the there some value is attached to the end result so for your child they don't they're not interested in having a clean room so why why are some of us interested in having a clean room well we like how it looks we feel better in it um, we're proud of ourselves for having accomplished that um, we're embarrassed about it when it's dirty um, we like to make our parents proud there's there's a lot of reasons why we some kids do this on their own and others don't. The others who don't, um, here, here's where they're coming from. I don't really care if I have to walk over all my clothes. Um, it actually, clutter actually makes me feel a little bit more secure. Um, I am, I don't, I just, I'm not motivated to do anything about this because so what if it's clean? There's no big di difference here. Um, I seem to get an, the same amount of love and attention and rewards from my parents, whether it's dirty or clean. So it's sort of, those are the things. So what you do is you establish a reinforcer that is powerful and that will differ for each individual. So for your child, it might be 
um, hey, you're not going to get any more coffee until you clean your room. I don't know what your child's <laughs> reinforcers are. Right. Uh, but for every 10 items of clothing you put away, you can get a cup of coffee. There you go. Tomorrow you'll get another cup if you have 10 more items that you put away. You have to find something that is motivating and reinforcing for the child. My son right now is taking summer school for three courses that he needs, that he wants to finish that are advanced placement courses. And I said, you finish these and you'll get um we'll get you the car that you want because wow. he's at that age now so it's sort of you know it has to be a powerful meaningful reinforcer for the individual you got to get them where they live it's the, thing, the yeah. thing that they want more than anything else okay skills question many of the skills uh involve the child giving a verbal response can skills still be used with nonverbal students if so do i just skip the verbal skills altogether for now and hope that they can be taught later on if if or when my child speaks no so yes, and a lot of skills, so this is how you, if your child is nonverbal, um, they have a way of communicating, right? It's either PECS or it's sign language or it's AUG device, you know, typing out things and so on. You, that's their language, that's their vocal. If you've decided that's their vocal, then those um, means of communication advance just like language does, just like speech does. So I wouldn't skip. The only lesson that you're going to skip is echoics, where we're teaching the child actual vocal pronunciation of the words, enunciation of words. But everything else that's in the language lesson that's an expressive lesson can be done also through a non-vocal modality. So for instance, I ask you, what is this? And you can't say pen, but you will, let's say, type pen, or you will point to the icon for pen, you know, those types of things. So um, the, the language, the speech of a non-vocal child is their communication modality. And I, I'm fairly certain, if I recall correctly, when you're doing that initial assessment, the, the questions that you ask before you get into the assessment, right. if you talk about um, the child being nonverbal, you're automatically directed to what I remember is a sheet that gives you some guidelines of what to do when you're working with a child who's preverbal or nonverbal to work on those lessons. If you have trouble finding it, make sure you write me back and I will have one of the skills people hook you up with where that is exactly. Right. And also, um, that's thank you for saying that that is a very important point and that's actually two points on that one is that that's why in in ABA we don't refer we don't even say nonverbal we say nonvocal because yes. vocal and verbal are quite different and yes. so any kind of expressive uh, any expression can be nonvocal as well and also um, you know having said all this we do also guide you in skills in regards to the first six to 12 months of things you can do to try to get the vocal to work. But if you're past that stage for sure and you're onto non-vocal communication, then there's a ton of modifications. And I do also recommend that you go to IBT yes. and look at the uh, visual modifications module because it will give Great you a idea. ton of ideas on how to use stimuli in the environment that uh, are allow your child to express. Yeah, it'll be very eye-opening. Okay, moving on to the next question. Hi, my son is four and just started ABA. Our BCBA just observed my son and said he is a different person at school. She said he was quiet and withdrawn at home. He's social and very talkative despite having a language delay. He doesn't have disruptive behavior at school, um, but does twirl his hair. So I think this is the same child as before. Uh, my son is constantly social with uh, with. Uh, with oh his peers i think with oh. other peers in fact he is not very social oh without his peers he's not very social with peers right he seems to have a, a period where he is talking like crazy and very aware uh, to not very aware and zoned out help is just hmm. help is this just part of autism and will this get better with aba a lot of different questions there yes. so um i guess from just things that are red flags in my head. First thing is, if you have a drastic change in behavior that's cyclical, so not not associated to different environments, like I, I couldn't tell in the beginning, I thought, okay, so there's a little bit of difference. There's a big difference in the child's behavior when he's at school versus home. That's very typical. That is 100% normal. That's to be expected of any child. Um, 
and it's good. It's actually a really good thing. I, I prefer that because uh, it shows that your child is aware and embarrassed and I love that because embarrassment is a very hard thing to teach yeah. so the fact that your child is aware and kind of like just aware of himself and like thinking what are these you know I'm, I'm not sure how I can socialize I better not mess up here or what are they thinking of me all that stuff is awesome because you could teach that stuff and you can just kind of teach him to integrate with his peers and so on and it, of course we're gonna be more social at home we're much more comfortable at home and it's also normal for kids to be much more social with adults than with peers, our kids, children on the spectrum, because adults help moderate the conversation. Adults are all over you. They reward you. They get in your face. They make their sentences simple. Other kids don't do any of that. Other kids are, you know, they get fed up with you if you don't catch up and they'll leave and they'll make fun of you and all that sort of stuff. So it's very normal that he's, uh, he's much better with adults and he's much better at home. All of that can and should be um, a part of your intervention with ABA. Um, but if you find the section that I, that, that I think concerned me a little bit is this whole, sometimes he's extremely verbal and social and other times he's extremely aloof. And if that's not environment, environment specific, but it's just a sort of a cyclical pattern in his behavior where he has highs and lows, then I would probably want to go see a neurologist and try to make sure that I'm not, I don't have other issues going on. There's maybe, uh, you know, there, you could, for instance, sometimes children have subclinical seizures and right before the seizure, they become extremely aloof and kind of just cautious. And we don't know because we never see the seizure right. and you won't know what's going on with him. But I want to make sure his physiological state is not causing him to shut down or isolate. So you just want to check on his health essentially you got to rule some things out rule some things out and, and not to worry you in any way but rule some things out but honestly what it sounds like to me is he's just reacting to his environment which is great and uh, you should have a therapist or an aide teaching him these things with him at school and he will improve definitely. okay great and then please be in contact with us and let us know what you find out we appreciate that okay uh i'm writing because we are card clients and thus far none of the bcbas on my son's case have been successful at all in terms of getting him to reduce his scripting he will go on and on and on and fill the silence almost any time he's not actively speaking to someone can you offer some new ideas it's truly does appear that he's just filling air with the sound mm -hmm. and he doesn't do it if he's actively listening to a tv program music or something along those lines thank right. you it's my pleasure and if you are a card client then i would appreciate you right back in to shannon give your information so that i can actually look at your child's case that would be good because i can easily pull up their skills accounts i can talk to your supervisor i can give some direct contact with uh, to your child and to your supervisor, I'd be happy to do that. Uh, so, if he, if if you really feel like he's, uh, um, you know, just trying to fill space, then there's two things that I would suggest, and it's possible your supervisor is already doing this. But and I don't know your the capability of your child, but what I would do is I would actually give him a two uh, well two things. First, I would give him a number of, of um, vocalizations that are appropriate, that would be fine to, to fill space. Uh, so for instance, uh, normal social communica communicative types of statements, like, uh, how was your day? What did you do today? And again, I don't know your child's age, functioning level, or anything like that, but uh, it's funny, there's a, you know, all typically developing people uh, feel uncomfortable when there's silence and they try to fill it with language uh, and we often will fill it with appropriate social little whatever you know the statements like oh and the weather is good yeah right? how's the weather today that's a, that's one hot of today isn't it isn't hot, hot enough for you hot, yeah. yeah exactly <laughs> yeah. exactly so you know all of those things are possible things to do but at the same time you want to teach your child that there are certain scenarios where he just needs to be comfortable with the silence and that's the simple shaping procedure so on the first and you want to have like maybe five or ten statements that can be used as fillers that are appropriate so they're not scripts and if they are actually scripts then you modify the script so like if he memorizes the five or ten statements you give him they just give him variations of it and once it gets to 20 or so he'll start modifying them i promise you that because kids don't want to memorize 20 exact things right then the next thing is you actually shape up 
uh, silence periods and you can do that very easily you can use a one minute egg timer you can start with a 10 second timer on a phone and what you you tell them the goal is to sit quietly yeah and um, you increase that to you know a normal uh, depending on your child's age again um, there, it's not a very high level amount of time that children of a certain age will stay quiet. Uh, you know, some kids, and you don't want him to stay quiet for too long anyway, but, you know, look at other children his age or let me know and I'll let you know what's appropriate and then you will basically try to teach him a combination of the two. So, you know, we're now quiet and you can your supervisor should easily be able to actually put them on a schedule like this and say oh so we're doing first the you know 15 seconds of silence and then one statement and then 30 seconds of silence and, and I know it sounds very rote but it's really just teaching the child what's socially appropriate because you know I, in certain um, cultures you silence is tolerated for hours in other cultures there is no silence I mean and that just contrast let's say the Japanese culture to the Italian culture right. there's quite a difference of how much interaction a social interaction and silence occurs so this is very easy to deal with or I can I'd be happy to consult with whoever your supervisor is okay great uh, one of our favorite viewers um, who is is studying to be a therapist himself wants to say congratulations to the doctor thank you and he wants to know how can you get a teenager going into the eighth grade to start believing in himself oh yeah that's really tough so one of the things I would say is uh, find something that the individual is good at you know I look at my kids and I have three children and they're all extremely different and they all have completely different capabilities and I'm their mom right so there's absolutely no, I mean, yeah, both of my daughters are very good at art, but they have completely different strengths. And you have to find the individual's strength. And this could be anything from, you know, the basic things that we look at, like athletics or music or, I don't know, I'm going to list, you know, photography, art, um, comedy, uh, writing, reading, whatever it is, mm -hmm. to, you know, obscure things like some kids love to do things like knitting yeah. uh, you know who cares origami origami whatever it is but find things that the individual is good at and uh, really really help them uh, establish a level of excellence in that thing so that they feel they have something they can always turn to um, and that they're better at let's yeah. put it that way so we all need a superpower we do we do and we need to have something that we believe in ourselves yeah. um that gives us a sense of comfort you know that this like this is a good example i i have abs i've never had and i never will have or i never probably in the beginning i did but you know i i don't have any anxiety about answering any question that has to do with autism whether it's an, on this show live giving a speech about it doesn't i could do it in my sleep right because i feel that i know what there is to know yeah. right so essentially you you get the individual to a to a level and I, let me tell you this changes lives like i've had kids where i've told the parents you know, why are we ignoring the fact that he's got this incredible uh, sense of music? Let's ha put him heavily into piano. And a year later, the child will come and they're playing like, you know, concerts. Mm -hmm. And I'm just astounded at their skill level. Um, there's so many kids that have like hidden talents that we just have to develop. Okay. And they just have to get reward out of it. And that will help improve their self-esteem quite a bit. We're totally out of time but uh we had somebody who did want to know when they want to ask you specifically when is the center for autism and related disorders book coming out oh well thanks for reminding me it should be coming out next month i All think right. so i mean we're it, we've submitted it quite a while ago and i think they had told us august Okay, and then we did have a question about, uh, specifically about Chicopee, Massachusetts, but I know a lot of times people will write in and want to know where What's can we get card? Uh, so I, I just want to take a second and say the, the first best thing to do is to go to centerforautism.com, right. click on the locations tab. You know better in terms of how close you are to things. If you see that you're within
within 50 miles of an office, you can absolutely call the 800 number and start the process of having that office. But maybe if you would take just 30 in seconds. In Massachusetts, we're in Plymouth and Woburn. Um, and we uh, most likely will probably expand even further. In states where there is coverage, we tend to get a lot of uh, families. But having said that, we also have remote services. So if you're yes. not close to one of our offices, you just still get in touch with the admissions at 800 and they will refer you to remote services. Remote services is where we actually send you a supervisor and sometimes we're even able to get insurance to cover all of this. So even the travel and accommodations. Mm -hmm. So the supervisor will come over, evaluate your child, uh, set up a program. We will hire and train therapists in your area for you. They will be card employees working with your child going through all of our training. And that means we'll do that even if it's just one child. And the uh, supervisor comes back and forth and also um, does Skype with you and sees you, your child weekly. And, um, you know, that's also an excellent way to go. Absolutely. So all of those things are available to you, but go to the Center for, go to centerforautism.com to start all of that process.